D5.2 normal sailing mixed with bicarb, 0.3 normal sailing with some KCL, it can I equals or plus 70. Yeah, that's how confusing some people make IV flu sound, especially in IC, but don't worry. On this video, we'll break it down a little bit. Hi guys and welcome back to our ICE series. If you're new here, my name is Fatai and I'm an attendant hospitalist working in South Carolina. On this channel, I teach medicine and I discuss topics around medical education. So please consider subscribing by hitting the subscribe button below and hitting the bell notification right next to it so you can get the videos as I upload them. On the previous video, we talked about how to present a case in the ICU. Uh, you can link to that video by clicking the card right above on this top corner of the screen. Uh, and in this video, I'll be walking you all, uh, through some of the uh, um, common IV fluids that we use in the ICU, when we use them, when we're supposed to avoid some of them, and some of the other questions surrounding how to select them. And uh, let's get right to it. Selecting IV fluids in the ICU is usually a tricky, you know, task because you have to balance the patient's lab findings with their uh, IV, IV fluid needs, and uh, you know that usually requires. Uh, careful attention to detail. So before we begin with the scenarios, let's just walk through some of the common IV fluids that we see in the ICU and their specific composition in terms of electrolyte, the pH and osmolality. We'll take you to the whiteboard and we'll do that right quick. So as promised, let's quickly go over some of the composition of the IV fluids. Um, like we mentioned, some of the IV fluids that we commonly encounter in the ICU would include um, lactated ringers, you know, lactated ringers is one of the examples, like I mentioned, of the balanced crystalloids. So I'm just going to add that, um, use the lactated ringers here to represent the balanced crystalloids. Then we'll talk about our 0.9% saline, the so-called not-so-normal saline. And then we'll talk about the 0.45% saline. And then we'll talk about our uh, D5W which is basically free water and then we'll also talk about our D5W with 0.45% saline. So what are some of the parameters that we're going to look at here? We're going to look at the pH, all right, we're going to look at the uh, sodium content, we'll look at the chloride content, we'll look at the, uh, what else can we look at here? Um, let's look at the osmolality. All right, uh, and then let's add finally here the lactate uh, uh, present in the fluid. So basically, um, with the lactate ringers, remember I mentioned that the pH is most similar to a, a serum pH, so it's, it's somewhere around 6.5, right? The sodium content in lactate ring is about 130, the chloride content is around 109, which is somewhat you know, closer to what we'd have normally in the in the body, uh, osmolality for lactate ring is about 275, uh, and the lactate content is about 28 here in lactate ringers. With normal sal uh, with 0.9% saline, uh, the pH is around 5, uh, the sodium content is 154, chloride content is also 154. If you add that together, osmolality will come to around 308, and it doesn't have any lactate in there. 0.45% uh, saline. Uh, the pH is around 5.6. Uh, the sodium content is half of what you have in 0.9 uh, saline. So here you have about 77. Uh, chloride content is also the same, 77. Osmolality is half of what you have here. So it's around 154. And it also doesn't have any lactate in there. Um, with D5W, the pH, I believe, is around 4.3. Doesn't have any sodium, doesn't have any chloride. Osmolality is around 252. Doesn't have any lactate in there. All right. And finally, with D5W with uh, 0.45 normal saline, 0.45 saline, uh, you have the pH is around, um, I believe, around 4.5. All right. Um, and the the sodium uh, obviously will be same as an half normal saline. 77 sodium, 77 chloride. Uh, the osmolality uh, is a runoff 408 and also doesn't have any lactic. So this, these are the main composition of the IV fluids that we use. The main point I want you to get from here is that lactate perhaps you know, has you know, similarities to the normal uh, serum values, but closer to it. Um, and in addition to that, it has uh, a lactate in there. And remember, this lactate doesn't 
carry the hydrogen ion and it's not going to worsen the acidosis. Lactate here eventually is converted to bicarbonate. In fact, the lactate present in lactate ringers is actually a buffer, all right, that will eventually be converted to bicarb. So back to the main video. So now that we've seen the composition of these uh, several IV flues, at least the common ones that we uh, encounter in the, uh, in the ICU, from the balanced crystalloids to the normal saline, well, not so normal saline, uh, and the 0.5, 0.45% uh, uh, saline, and then the D5 and D5 combination with 0.45% uh, saline. These are some of the usual ones, and that's why I specifically mentioned them. Uh, but before we go uh, uh, further, let's talk about specific scenarios where you'd actually need IV fluids. Um, the first and most important, well, most common scenario where you definitely need IV fluids to be able to treat a patient accordingly or save their lives is in fluid resuscitation where you have a f patient with significant volume deficit and you need to replace that volume. So that's one. Fluid resuscitation, all right. The second uh, other scenario where you might need IV fluids is for maintenance therapy uh, because in certain cases, whether it's during the perioperative period or patients that are not able to feed you know, uh, entirely, you will definitely need some IV hydration to, to, to maintain them for that short period of time because you, you have to account for the fact that they're losing uh, uh, fluids from their skin via all of this Common, part, common forms of insensible uh, uh, fluid loss, whether it's from the skin, for patients that are ventilated from that process, or patients that are acutely febrile. So these are patients constantly losing fluid, and if you're not going to feed them, you have to give them some form of IV fluid uh, uh, replacement. So again, fluid resuscitation, maintenance therapy, uh, some of the other reasons why we might give IV fluids uh, will be specific diagnosis. I, I won't go into all of this different diagnoses where we actually give IV fluids, but let's talk about the ones we may encounter in the ICU. So uh, uh, we can talk about patients like DK and HHS. Obviously, there's some, there's some uh, fluid uh, uh, deficit in those patients that you have to replace that. Uh, we can also talk about patients with free water uh, loss that come with hypernatremia. Uh, we will talk about that as well. And then, um, you know, some patients that are requiring caloric needs, uh, we'll talk about the fact that we probably shouldn't, you know, depend on just IV fluids and we'll move further to proper, proper nutrition for those kinds of patients. Let's talk about fluid resuscitation. The two options are, are of IV fluids that will serve, uh, you know, the best purpose in fluid resuscitation will be the saline, all right, 0.9% saline, and your lactate ringers, or this, some of the other balanced crystalloids like plasma light and uh, some of the others. Uh, but I, I try to, f you know, just stay around saline and lactate ringers. Lactate ringers here representing the balanced crystalloids, and saline here, the not so normal, you know, saline here representing the saline based fluids, if you can call them that. All right, so contrary to what you may have seen practiced, the lactate ringers tends to edge the saline, and this is because of a lot of things. From the whiteboard presentation, we talked about the specific composition of these fluids. Let's take normal saline, for example. Normal saline has about 154 milliequivalents of sodium, and it has just the same number, 154 milliequivalents of chloride. If you put the osmolo um, uh, properties of these two uh, 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 electrolyte composition, it brings osmolality of normal saline to about 308. And that is, you know, somewhat hypertonic compared to the, the serum osmolality. So that's one problem there. The osmolality of normal saline doesn't kind of match with, you know, our serum osmolality. Second thing, um, you also consider that the heavy chloride content in normal saline tends to contribute to something called, you know, uh, the, the, the strong iron uh, uh, difference, which in, in normal saline is low. And when you have a lower strong iron difference, you tend to have the potential to you know, generate acidosis uh, more. And that is why normal saline causes non-anion gap hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and that's that's a, usually a big problem if you're dealing with patients that are already in some form of acidosis from lactic acidosis and whatnot you know worsening that acidosis with several boluses of normal saline is just not the right way to go um lactate ringers on the other hand you uh 
before I go on, just mention the pH of normal saline as well. It's around 5 to 5.5. That's also a bit more acidic compared to the normal pH of the serum. So let's talk about lactate ringers on the other hand now. Lactate ringers uh, mostly contains about 130, from what you see in the white boy, 100, 130 uh, uh, milliequivalents of sodium, which is kind of, you know, lower than normal saline and uh, about 109 milliequivalents of, uh, of chloride, which is significantly lower than normal saline. And the pH of lactate ringers is about uh, very similar to what we have in the serum. So because of those reasons, um, because of uh, a higher strong iron difference in this you know, particular fluid, there is a less risk of developing metabolic acidosis. And um, if you compare, because of the pH as well, if you compare that to normal saline, it's just overall uh, a better fluid. And how do I know this? I'm not just pulling this out of my you know, back pocket. It's really, if you look at the SALT ED trial and you look at the SMART trial, these trials have been able to show that first there is increased risk of uh, uh, renal dysfunction with using normal saline as compared to LR. And second, uh, there is also a mortality increase with using uh, uh, normal saline. Uh, compared to LR, and these are very important things. So let's quickly answer some of the common misconceptions people have, or some of the common questions people have uh, around using LR uh, over NS, which is what really evidence-based medicine suggests at this time. Um, what are some of those questions people would say, oh, patient has lactic acidosis, can I still use lactate ringers because of the presence of lactate in lactate ringers? The, the answer to that question is lactate is very different from lactic acid because lactate does not have the hydrogen ion uh, you'd find in lactic acid. So lactate in itself um, doesn't create that acidity. And in fact, the lactate, when it gets into the body, it will be converted, let's assume the liver is functioning properly, it will be converted to bicarbonate that eventually causes, you know, tends to push the serum towards alkalosis. So lactate in lactate ringers does not worsen the acidosis. If anything, it pushes the serum towards alkalosis. Uh, so feel free to use your lactic, uh, lactate ringers in patients that are already have lactic acidosis. You know, it, it won't worsen that acidosis because the lactate will be converted to bicarb. And in, sometimes uh, for patients with liver failure, uh, I'll talk about liver failure and lactate ringers um, in some of the places where you may want to avoid LR. But the other question people would have about using lactate ringers is because of the potassium content in lactate ringers. Um, we know that in a liter of lactate ringers, you have about four milli equivalent of, uh, of potassium, and people will say if a patient already has hyperkalemia, you know, given lactate ringers, would that worsen it and whatnot? The answer to that is the using normal saline in a patient that already has hyperkalemia because normal saline has the potential to cause acidosis, and you know when there is acidosis, the hydrogen-potassium exchanges will tend to favor hyperkalemia in acidosis. So really, the acidosis that is created by that uh, 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 no, administering normal saline tends to be, you know, to favor hyperkalemia. If you flip that now to LR, formally equivalent of of uh, um, uh, of potassium in LR is most will definitely be lower than what you'd have in the serum of a patient that has hyperkalemia. And because you're given that, because of the volume distribution of, of, of uh, potassium, you will most likely theoretically generate you know, less serum potassium because of how potassium distributes across the ECF and ICF. You will tend to generate lower potassium in uh, the serum if that's really, you know, if we go based on theory. And in addition to that, it will probably, you remember what we give patients that are hypokalemic, right? We give them about most, on average, we give them about 40 MEQ of potassium. And that would expect to raise their serum potassium by 0.4 uh, milli equivalent. So if they were at 3.4, we most likely would expect that that goes to 3.8. That 40 milli equivalent of potassium that we're given, if we think about LR, it has 4 milli equivalent of potassium. So it really takes you giving at least, you know, 10 liters of LR you know, to be able to achieve that 40 milli equivalents that would normally give with a push in a patient with hypokalemia. So, you know, 
by and large, it really doesn't equate to worsening uh, their hyperkalemia in, in patients that already have hyperkalemia. And if you were to use NS, you're more likely to worsen that hyperkalemia. So patients with hyperkalemia, using LR does not really you know, worsen that hyperkalemia. You're better off treating the hyperkalemia and just continue to use LR because you know you're not worsening acidosis. And overall, these patients tend to do well, so hyperkalemia is not really is not really a contraindication. Some people say it's relative, and this is still debatable. But this is just my thought around this. So those are the two uh, common questions we would have around using lactate ringers in patients with you know already has a, a lactic acidosis or patients that have hyperkalemia. Uh, the next question will be, you know, the, the, you, you may be asked, or people may ask that, why should I avoid LR in fluid resuscitation? When should I avoid LR? Um, you know, although there is still limited data, some of the initial suggestion about L avoiding LR now will be seen in patients with traumatic brain injury because you expect that, you know, because of the slight hypotonicity of LR, um, using that kind of fluid in a patient with traumatic brain injury might cause some fluid shift and worsen cerebral edema and things like that but again there's still uh, you know positive data to to establish that but that's just going based on, on theory so you, you should I would say avoid LR in a patient with traumatic brain injury um, the other case where you may want and this this really is debatable as well you may want to avoid LR in a patient that um, that has liver failure, for example, because you know that whatever lactate is present in the LR has to be converted to bicarb to you know, really exhaust some of the, uh, the, 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 the effects of LR. Um, you, you, in a patient with liver failure, they're not able to do that. So you may have elevated serum lactate, and that could be worrisome for whoever is looking at the labs. It may cause panic in the, in the, in the, in the minds of whoever is taking care of that patient. So it's okay to avoid it in that case, you know, to be honest. But again, if I were to dial back down into some theory, remember that, you know, lactate or lactate in the serum not, does not necessarily suggest, um, does not all the time suggest uh, 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 ischemia. If the liver is failing, you have lactate elevation, you may just feel like it's just the inability of the liver to convert that lactate and that may not be, you know, a terrible thing. Um, and in addition to that, some of the tissues like the brain and uh, cardiac tissues use lactate also in severe ischemic conditions. So. Um, I would, you know, just to be on the safe side and not have my patient have lactate of 20 in the serum, I still give them lactate ringers. I probably would avoid LR in a patient with liver failure, and I also would avoid LR in a patient with um, uh, traumatic brain injury, based on the thing that I, I explained earlier. So another question or another scenario where we use IV fluids, obviously would be our DKA patient and our HHS patient. Um, the question usually is what IV fluid is the best. You may still see some people using you know, normal saline. And I, I just think that's really terrible because you understand that these patients with DKA are already coming with uh, you know, metabolic acidosis. And you know, using NS in that case is only going to worsen that acidosis. And even in patients with HHS, sometimes they come with acidosis as well. Um, and you know, worsening that acidosis with using NS just doesn't make sense. Um, the I I ideal fluid I would suggest in patients with DKA and HHS, uh, uh, for, specifically for DKA because of the acidosis, would be anything that doesn't worsen the acidosis, uh, particularly. LR is a good choice. You know, uh, LR already has some potassium in it, and if you're thinking that when you start insulin therapy, you would, the insulin in the, uh, uh, would tend to drive potassium back into the cells and potentially cause hypokalemia, uh, you would need to replace uh, uh, potassium anyway, so why not just give LR that already has some potassium in it? Um, you could also use your half normal saline uh, because you know, that doesn't necessarily worsen the acidosis as much as NS, um, and in addition to that, you can mix the KC with, with your half NS. So for DK uh, uh, maintenance fluid, as they continue to receive their infusion, you would I would I would give you know half NS or LR in that case. I would avoid NS as much as I can. I don't want to hear it. Nah nah nah. Don't 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 don't, don't, don't mention it. Right. That's it for our lecture today on IV flus. I hope it's been helpful. If you have any more questions, you can leave them in the comment section below. You can follow me on Instagram because I have you know, lots of contents on there as well. We do daily flashcard teasers and, you know, uh, on there, the, my, my 
hand, my Instagram handle is FatayMD underscore, or you can find me on the Instagram for this channel, which is Residence Cove IM. Um, I'm putting them up here. I appreciate you guys for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.